The story of the coming of the Holy Spirit to the New Testament church. Uh, what a joy it had to have been for them and what a joy it is for us. You may have noticed the title of the sermon, What to Expect When You're Expecting. Now for me it was a 2012 movie starring Jennifer Lopez, Cameron Diaz, Chris Rock, Dennis Quaid, just to name a few. And that movie would follow five couples as they became parents. But more than a movie, probably what some of you all might be more familiar with, is what to expect when you are expecting. It was, it was a book. It's attributed to the author uh, Heidi Murkoff, as well as some others. And the book was first published in 1984. Well, it's now in its fifth edition, and there's an estimated 22 million of those books in print. Now, the book is touted as America's Pregnancy Bible which answers all your baby questions. This is from head to toe, from back to front. I, I've seen this book gifted uh, at more than one baby shower. I've also seen it in a pile of books at people's homes with babies and on bookshelves uh, where people have had babies. And a poll showed that if a woman was to read a book, what, uh, when they were, a, a guidebook when they were pregnant, 93% of them read what to expect when you're expecting. I don't own a copy. I don't have a need for a copy. I haven't bought it as a gift for someone, but I can only imagine how comforting it must be to have those answers at your fingertips. <laughs> There's some questions that were listed, uh, um, like, you know, is fish safe to eat? Should I have a 4D ultrasound? What are my rights as it pertains to my employment? How will I know if I'm gone into labor? It's nice to know what to expect when you're expecting. It's nice to know what to expect in every circumstance. We said today, it's, it's Pentecost Sunday, as I told the kids, it's the birthday of the church. It's the day that we remember when the Holy Spirit descended in a mighty wind, tongues of flames, 3,000 converts. Jesus had told the disciples to expect the Holy Spirit, but he didn't tell them what to expect. I can only imagine that they wish that they had that guidebook, Israel's Holy Spirit Bible. Though, I'm not sure anything could have prepared them for this helper, for this advocate, for this counselor who was to come. Now, um, in the liturgical calendar, Pentecost has been like shortened into one Sunday, but how in the world can you speak to the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the birth of the church and, and, and what God has for us when we are filled with the Spirit in one Sunday? Don't worry, I'm not going to try. Even though it said Peter preached a long time and there were 3,000 converts, I wonder how long we have to wait for 3,000 converts. Anyway, uh, here we go. Uh, we are going to talk about the Holy Spirit for several weeks. Um, and... And I will say, I've been reading the book um, called Forgotten God. We're going to be looking at that third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, which um, does seem to be forgotten in so many ways uh, in the church and even in our own lives. But don't worry, we won't be preparing that guidebook, what to expect when you're expecting the Holy Spirit. Uh, instead, it's going to be more of an invitation more of an invitation to surrender to the Holy Spirit, to surrender to the unexpected uh, God. But before we go further, let's pause and pray. Holy Spirit, move in power. We are thankful for your presence among us, and let us feel your presence, that, that mighty wind. Let us hear your voice. Let us wait, and let us pray, and let us receive that power to be your witnesses to the world. Holy Spirit, move in power. Convict us in those places where we need convicting. Convince us.
convince us where we need convincing. Cleanse those places which are impure and create in us a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within us. Holy Spirit, speak in us and to us. Speak in me and to me that you might speak through me or in spite of me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now I want to, to give us a little bit of context as, as to when Jesus told them to expect the Holy Spirit. Now, he had just washed their feet. Talk about unexpected. We're talking about their teacher and their leader, the one that they had begun to say, well, this is the Messiah, washing their feet. Jesus, having also just transformed that Passover meal from remembering God's deliverance from slavery in Egypt to a meal which indicated the deliverance that Jesus would offer for all of humanity through his broken body and shed blood. I'm not sure they saw that one coming either. And then he says, look, I'm out of here. I can only imagine that their heads were spinning at this, po at this point. But in all of this, Jesus tells his disciples he's not going to leave them alone. He isn't going to leave them orphaned, but instead, God the Father is sending another. Now, an interesting fact here is that word another means exactly like the first. You know, it's not like, well, I'll get you another, you know, that one broke, I'll get you another one, you know, that might be for whatever. No, exactly like the one. So, so God the Father is sending one, the one, the Holy Spirit, would be exactly like Christ. And that had to be a comforting thought. Jesus had also told them, it's to your advantage that he go. And Jesus says, if, if he doesn't go, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't come. And again, I'm sure the disciples were full of a lot of questions. I know I would have been. How could this invisible spirit be better than this human who was by my side, who I could see, who I could eat with, who I could laugh with? Now, it wasn't that the disciples had never heard about the Holy Spirit. It isn't like the Spirit of God was some foreign concept. After all, in the beginning, you know, it always goes back to the beginning. No, in the beginning, it says that the Spirit hovered over the waters, and then the unexpected happened. God spoke, and the creation of the cosmos began. The Holy Spirit wasn't absent in the Old Testament, but in large part, the disciples would have associated the Holy Spirit with the prophets. The ones who were the messengers of God. And you can be certain they didn't put themselves in that category. The Holy Spirit was also, uh, was also connected to end times. And, and so it had to be quite puzzling as to what Jesus meant. What Jesus meant washing their feet. What Jesus meant in this is my body broken for you. This is my blood poured out for you. What Jesus meant in terms of the Holy Spirit would come and that would be better than him. But... Back to Jesus' promise. On that last night, with, him, with he and his disciples, he told them, don't let your hearts be troubled. He told them he was the way, the truth, and the life. He told them that they would not be orphaned. He told them that, that they would receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would remind them of, of what he taught them. I thought that was, the, that, for me, that was key. All right, I don't have to try to remember all of these things. No, but the Holy Spirit would remind them, and the Holy Spirit would lead them in all truth. And he called them to be expected. Now, I imagine the horror of the cross muddied the thoughts of the disciples. Their grief was certainly overwhelming. Their disappointment, I would say, in themselves for having ab abandoned Christ had to have, have been, uh, had, had to have abounded. But there was still that promise. The promise of the Holy Spirit, whether they remembered it or not. The promise of another one, just like Jesus, to lead and to guide and to direct but how can that be so? Because Jesus is dead. Well, surprise, we know the story, right? Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And then 40 days later, he ascended into heaven. But before he ascended into heaven, he reminded the disciples once more that they were to expect the Holy Spirit. They were to stay in Jerusalem and wait. They weren't to, do, they weren't to leave, they weren't to do anything until they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I've wondered often what was going through their minds as they gathered to, to wait. Now, now, in waiting, it wasn't like they were just like twiddling their thumbs, like, okay, what's going on? No, waiting. They were gathered together, and they were in prayer with one another. They were worshiping. But they didn't know what to expect, nor did they know when to expect it. You know, 
at least pregnant women know that if all goes well, the baby will make an appearance around 40 weeks. But you see, it had taken over 400 years for the pro from the prophets to Jesus' birth. Imagine the disciples are surely it's not going to be 400 years because we're not going to make it that far, right? Um, and, it was over, and it was only three years of ministry before Jesus was crucified. Would they have to wait three years? It was just three days before he rose from the dead. So, so maybe this is going to be, you know. But it was 40 days before he ascended into heaven. You know, were they, were, I don't know, I run numbers all the time, right? So were, were they like, okay, you know, well, surely it's not 400 years. At, well, they only had to wait 10 days. Now, I imagine it had been 10 long, agonizing days. Because you got to see their grief had become real once more, right? That they had had Jesus with them for 40 days after his death. It was, you know, that, that idea, and now they had to let him go again. Well, as I was pondering this, I'm trying to find the right words to put it. You know, we read this, and, and, it, and it makes sense to us, but think about having lost a loved one, and then having them back for 40 days, and then they're gone again. Yes, Jesus had taught and told them. Yes, they understood that he was, understood in theory that he was ascending into heaven and that the comforter would come, but there still had to be this overwhelming grief, even in the excitement of expecting the Holy Spirit. I imagine those days were full of questions, maybe even healthy debates about what they could expect. And I wonder if there were moments when a disciple piped up and go, I think I felt something. Or, did you hear that? <laughs> Imagine after a day or three, there was a disciple or two that were like, eh, we've waited long enough, I, I, I don't think so. Maybe there were some disciples who loved a good surprise. No, I really want to know what I'm supposed to expect. But maybe they, this, was, this was their thing, and they were, they were just, just full of that anticipation and not the dread of what might come. But whatever else might have been going on in that room in Jerusalem as the disciples gathered, we do know. We know that they were praying. We know that they were united together. And we know that when the time arrived, when the Holy Spirit came, there was no doubt that God was in the building. No doubt. They had felt the Spirit. It was a, you know, it was a mighty wind. And Marilyn and I, uh, Marilyn, Virginia and I were just having a discussion uh, like last Friday in terms of what does a tornado sound like? Sounds like a train, a freight train. I guess what you don't hear it till it's there. Uh, but this idea that, that there was no mistaking whether it, they heard the wind and they felt the wind. But there was more. There were flames and flames that looked like tongues and, and they were over one another's head. And, and um, can you imagine like John's looking at Mar or John's looking at Matthew going, there's something, and Matthew's looking at John like, and, you know, because they don't see themselves, but this, this sense that there was no doubt that the Holy Spirit had come. They didn't know what to expect, but it had arrived. But wait, there's more. Not only the tongues of fire, but voices of praise. They were witnessing to all the things that God had done, but, but there was something even different about that. Their praises were offered in languages that they didn't know, but in the languages of the people who were gathered in Jerusalem, gathered to celebrate the festival of, the Penteco of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit, as a wind, ruach, the breath of God, the breath that filled humanity at the beginning, the breath, the Spirit of God that, that can give life to the dry bones uh, that we read about in Ezekiel, turning them into armies. The breath that came to give life to the church and fire and tongues, the words of praise so that all would hear and all would know and all would understand. Of course, there were some who dismissed that, ah, just drunk, right? No, Peter says, no, listen. And Peter began to preach. See, <laughs> if you didn't believe, that the Holy Spirit had showed up in the wind, if you didn't believe that the Holy Spirit had showed up in the, in the flames, uh, that, the flames that looked like tongues, if you didn't believe that the Holy Spirit had, had shown up in all of the different languages, you had to believe that the Holy Spirit showed up when Peter, a fisherman who often didn't get it right, began to proclaim the gospel in such a way that 3,000 people came to know and, and profess 
Christ and believe. Repent and believe me. Francis Chan's book, Forgotten God. He begins with a bunch of questions, and I have a bunch of questions. And I think back to what I was talking to with the kids. This is a balloon, right? It's a balloon. But it's not a fun balloon. It's not a balloon serving its purpose. What does it need? It needs wind. I think too often our own lives, and not just our own lives, but the life of the church, is like this. <laughs> Yeah, we're the moon, or yeah, we, we are a disciple. Yeah, we are a church, but we're missing the Holy Spirit. We're missing that which makes us all that God created us to be. We walk around as if, as if we have no power, and yet Scripture tells us we have the resurrection power. We walk around as, as if as if we're supposed to be unhappy, as if we're supposed to be miserable, as if we're supposed to be misers and impatient and and unloving and and have no control, but yet we're told the power of the Holy Spirit gives us the fruit of the Spirit. And I think there are times that that we show up and we know the story of Pentecost, we know it's the birthday of the cross, yay, red, come Holy Spirit, doves, flames, woohoo! But we don't believe that it can happen still today. We don't believe that it ought to be happening still today. That's just a story. It's just a story in our history. That's just a story in the Bible. But no, it is to be our story. It's to be our story. And that's the only way that the world will be transformed is when we allow ourselves as individuals to be filled with the Spirit, as, as we allow ourselves to operate in that unexpected, that, that we are willing to come together and to pray. And, you know, I, I reluctantly, but I won't go into all my thoughts. In the last several weeks, almost the last month, there has been a part on the announcement sheet that said, let us pray. Anybody interested in praying? Hey, come see me. Let's figure out how we can pray as a congregation. And it's been crickets. How can we be the church for this world when we're not together in in prayer, when we're not waiting on the Holy Spirit, when when we're not expecting God? Now, you might remember a story of of a person who who God showed up to and they weren't expecting him. And it was was Zechariah, John the Baptist's father, who was a priest. And and he was like his once once, one time of the year in the temple doing his work as a priest. And he was surprised when God showed up. The one who was supposed to be expecting God to show up wasn't. And you know what happened? He became mute. (laughs) He wasn't able to speak until his son was born because he couldn't even believe that God would show up. I think in many ways the church has become mute (laughs) because we don't expect God to show up. We come here on a Sunday morning and and I don't know, did y'all come here today expecting God to show up? Did you come here today expecting to leave differently? Do you expect tomorrow to be different from today in a way that is in a way that is is, is not worse but, but better? In, in a way that is, is you fulfilling all of what God wants you to be, you being witnesses to the world of the amazingness of God. When we don't come expecting God. We, in effect, make ourselves mute. We, in effect, silence ourselves. We've got to come expecting. We've got to come waiting in the the means by which we are praying together, in the means by by which we are sharing the gospel, in the ways that, that we are studying together and reading together. We've got to surrender ourselves. Francis Chan in his book spoke more about this idea of, of, you know, some of us say, oh, we just, you know, we don't want too much of God. As if you could get too much. I mean, God is infinite and we're finite. There's there's no getting too much of God, but but too often we want to, like, put a cap on it, right? Mm -hmm. Because God might expect more from us than we're willing to give. And I was thinking about the disciples, you know. um, How easy would it have been to say, Jesus, we gave you a good three years, and 40 days, you know. We give you a good three years following you around. We, we did what you asked us to do. This waiting on the Holy Spirit thing is, is one step too far. 
Because you know what happened is then all of those disciples, as they went out to preach the gospel, lost their lives for the gospel. We've got to allow ourselves to want more and more of God and to surrender more and more of ourselves so that the Spirit might fill us more and more so that, that there would be 3,000 converts. <laughs> and, and we will talk later as, as we move through this, but if, if why it's called the birthday of the church, 3,000 um, were, you know, 3,000 that day, but then it sets up what the church did, and, and they were so filled with the Spirit, they were so filled with the love of God that they couldn't help but love one another. They couldn't help but go, I'm going to sell my stuff so that we all can eat. I'm going to sell my stuff so that we can all have clothes. I'm going to sell my stuff so that we can all um, share the gospel to the world. And it's day by day numbers were being added. I can, and we can get very discouraged, and I know when I express um, to, to colleagues or whatnot that, you know, the attendance numbers are down, churches are dying, they're like, well, every, everywhere that's happening. Well, it's not happening in many of the nations in Africa, it's not happening in, in many of the nations in, in Asia or even Eastern Europe. Um, it doesn't have to happen. We act like, well, we can't do anything about it. But the reason that, that it's happening is because we aren't doing anything about it because we aren't allowing the Spirit to work in us. And I say we, because I'm a part of it too. You know, one of the questions he asked in his book, and he says, so where have you been seeing the Spirit at, at work? He says, and if you haven't, then, and I thought, well, no, I'm going to come up with an answer. So i got to have an answer. i got to have an answer. And I mean, I do see God at work. And, and, and some, I mean, I do see the Spirit at work. But I don't think I see the Spirit at working as significantly as it could be, uh, even in my own life. So I come to you this day, church, and I say, you know, um, in terms of what to expect, first of all, we've got to be expecting. <laughs> Secondly, God does the unexpected, so you just have to be expecting. You have to be expecting for God to show up, and God is good. And so you've got to know that when God shows up, it's going to be good. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be life-giving as the wind. It's going to be that which, which gives us the voice to witness, the power to do so. We try to operate under our own power. I try to operate on, under my own power, and this is what we end up with. Empty pews and empty lives. But we have resurrection power that's offered to us in the Holy Spirit. We just have to expect it, and we have to want it, and we have to surrender to it. We come this day again to the table, and I think you all got little slips of paper again. Again, remember, Thanksgiving precedes the, the, the miracles. Coming to the table with our Thanksgiving, we experience the grace, of, uh, we receive the grace of Christ, and we take it with us, and we have joy and peace. All of that, all of that fed and, and fostered by the power of the Spirit. And so, as we come today, not only with our thanksgiving, again, I, I invite you just to pause. I mean, kneeling is great, but even, even if all you can do, or standing, I know some of kneeling is hard for some, just to pause. And even if it's only, God, I want to want to be filled with your spirit. God, I want to want to surrender myself to your power. Do it. Start there. But maybe you get to the place of, like, Lord, just pour it on. I can't live like this anymore. The church can't be like this anymore. Let us this day not leave here with this as our future, right? Let us leave here being all that God has called us to be and longing for more. As we prepare for the table it is important that we come and we confess our sins before God and one another. And so we pray this here, the prayer of confession is on the back side of your bulletin. It says, Trusting in the promise of grace, let us tell the whole truth about ourselves and beg for God's mercy for the renewal and changing of our lives. Let us pray. Without your power, O oh God, we are lost. We have done things we would avoid. And what you desire, we have not done. Now offer your personal confessions.
continue in prayer. By your purifying fire, transform our lives, guide us into honesty and compassion, so that filled with your peace, our dreams and visions may be one with yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now hear, hear these words of forgiveness. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By the power in whom we live and move and have our being, I proclaim to you the complete forgiveness of all your sins through the Holy Trinity, one God, whose mercy is everlasting. Thanks be to God. Again, a reminder to bring um, your, your Thanksgiving. And, and, and I want a, a specific thing, a specific thing that happened this week. Um, I, I, all, of the, all of the general family, friends, the, the, yes, those are things to be thankful. But I'm trying to encourage, encourage us to really be thankful in all things. And the two examples I gave, Mary Fraser, who comes to um, Bible study on Fridays, but she brought me a Coke Zero this Friday last Friday, anyway, and so I'm very thankful for that, and, and I also got a Chick-fil-A gift card in the mail from uh, another church member from Lodge Forest, and I'm very thankful. Those little things uh, were great, so so again, just, you know, um, no Thanksgiving is minor. I'm just asking for something more specific than general, uh, but let us uh, prepare our hearts for the table, and I'll be um, going to, to move to pray. And those of you that are online with us, we do invite you to, to participate with us in Holy Communion. You are a part of our community, and, and so... Um, to prepare yourself also, um, come with Thanksgiving, and also, you know, find something bread-like and, and water or juice uh, would work as well, so.
So the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ poured out for you. We thank you for, for being a part of our community. And, we, and I pray, we pray that you might be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life radically different from the one you're living now. A life of more and more peace and joy, more and more patience and generosity, and more and more love. May you indeed go about your day. Go about your day knowing the infinite love of, that God has for you. And in that, uh, may you be loved by God. May you love God and show God's love everywhere to everyone. That by the power of the Holy Spirit, your life will be changed and disciples will be made in this world will be transformed.